Our next presenter is Judith Ross. Judith comes to us from the San Diego State University and worked with Adriana Foster and Isla Simpson in our lab for uh, climate and global dynamics. Judith's oral presentation is titled Optimizing Agroforestry Practices Through Remote Sensing, Analyzing Vegetative Dynamics and Climate Adaptation in San Diego County. Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here. Um, like Jerry said, I'm Judith Ross, and uh, yeah, this is what I've been working on uh, during the summer. Um, so a big question that people have usually is, what is agroforestry? And agroforestry is a combination of trees, crops, and animals on landscape in different spatial or temporal combinations. And it's an ecological intensification strategy. So I also have a cute diagram um, <laughs> that takes a very complicated agroecological concept and actually does a very nice job summarizing it. Um, so it typically, uh, some of the benefits of agroforestry is shielding livestock and crops from wind and extreme weather. It also increases crop yields as it is a closed system, provides habitat for pollinators, sequesters carbon, builds soil health, uh, slows runoff and soil erosion, and improves water quality. But what I'm most interested uh, from agroforestry for this project specifically is it creates microclimates, and I'll go into that. Uh, there are many different classifications of agroforestry and agroforestry practices. And globally, it's quite significant as it, agroforestry covers 43% of agricultural land globally and engages 900 million people worldwide. Uh, so my study area is San Diego County. And San Diego County has almost $2 billion in ag production. Um, it accounts uh, for 200,000 acres of cultivated land. It exports to 43 different countries and is the first in the USA for number of organic farms. And it's a first in the USA for number of small farms, which includes less than 10 acres. So some of the motivations for this project, uh, working with Isla, we worked with the CESM climate model. And some of the, our outputs uh, predicted that countywide, uh, the annual average temperature will increase by about 2 degrees Fahrenheit by 2050 and be up to 6 degrees uh, warmer than average from 1990 to 2010. And by 2050, an average year could be as hot as 2014, which is that red pointed arrow. And this has major implications for top crops for the regions, particularly avocados, citruses, and grapes, uh, as uh, high heats can really impact phenological aspects like uh, floral uh, bud production and also the development of the fruit itself. So major economic implications for the county. Uh, we did have some um, implications using the CESM model as those grid sale scales are quite large. So uh, this might not be as targeted and focused um, as farmers would like their climate models to be, um, but San Diego County is a very large county and we wanted to be able to provide data that could be generalized for the county. Uh, so my research question is, is, how do tree density and above ground biomass estimates correlate with land sur surface temperatures and evaporative stress in different agricultural zones of San Diego County? And sort of the overarching question is, what practical implications do these correlations have for the design and management of agroforestry systems in response to extreme heat and drought conditions? Um, so we're analyzing two different variables for this study. We're looking at land surface temperature um, using EcoStress, which is a program ran by the International Space Station from 2018 to 2022. Um, it, most of the project was targeted for urban heat island effects, but we're modifying some of the uh, land surface temperatures, and they did capture um, vegetative property, properties as well. So we are using that and uh, utilizing those variables. 
and the drought index ratio um, in which evapotranspiration is compared to potential evapotranspiration, and it's a ratio that ranges from zero to one, zero being full, uh, full water stress, one being no water stress. Um, so one is essentially represents um, that your plant or vegetation is not experiencing stress at all. Um, it has very high resolution with spatial coverage of any area. And however, cloud cover can affect the results of uh, evaporative stress indexes. So some of, the, some of the data that was utilized was land surface temperature and evaporative stress index that was used by the ecosystem spaceborne thermal radiometer experiment on the space station, that's ecostress, as I mentioned before. That spatial resolution covers about 70 meters and is multispectral thermal infrared ranging between 8 and 12.5 micrometers. And the data that we utilized since this was a preliminary uh, study was the most recent data. So within, uh, so from November 2021 to October 2022. Uh, so the, uh, the way that we're going to compare this data is using two different kind of later uh, data sources. So we looked at tree densities, including trees per hectare. And that data source is the National Agriculture Imagery Program, or NAEP, which I'll be referring to. And that spatial resolution is extremely high at one meter. And the way that that data is collected is using nominal space pulsing LIDAR. And that was collected from 2014 to 2015. The other uh, LIDAR data source that we're going to be using uh, we'll be calculating above ground biomass, which is the weight of plant material per unit area. So this one per in particular calculates metric tons over hectares. And uh, the data source is JEDI L4A footprint, level above ground biomass density version 2.1. And that spatial resolution uh, is one kilometer and it's waveform LIDAR, LIDAR. And it's also collecting data between November 2021 and October 2022. And then we wanted to make this really uh, available for particular farms. And San Diego has a very um, uh, wide uh, geo database called SANDAG. And they actually manually digitize polygons. So these are, I believe, over 1,500 polygons that were manually digitized. So I, I don't envy whoever did that. Um, so our methods, uh, we needed site specifications. So particularly for JEDI that had a larger grid, um, we decided to focus on farms in San Diego County that were actually above 10 acres. And then we compared that to uh, both kinds of LIDAR data, looking into both types of eco-stress variables. And then we did a regressional analysis and then seasonal cycle analysis. So hopefully this works. Um, this is the NAEP data. So um, I took a little uh, snippet of the NAEP data. So here in the blue, you can see row crops, which have almost no elevation at all. And then you can see the tree densities. This is an avocado farm. Uh, these row crops are strawberry, I believe. And then you can see different kinds of compositions between the orchards. So these have more of rows. These are more cluster base. And then there's such high variability between crop types in San Diego County. So this really kind of represents everything that's going on in a very nice uh, resolution. Um, and so what we were looking at was uh, the tree density categories, basically between no trees, low trees, so that's 1 to 40 trees per hectare, moderate density, which is 40 to 100 trees per acre, uh, high density, which is 130 trees per acre, and uh, very high density, which is over 200 trees per acre. Um, and what we found was that um, for land surface temperatures, uh, no tree density ended up going to like the more extremes uh, within temperature. Uh, 
in the winter time, so that's January, and then ended up going really high um, over the summer. So there is some mild buffering happening uh, between temperature extremes and uh, tree density. Uh, however, for average monthly ESI, we did have some um, disturbances in the data, so it does show a very high correlation. However, in the seasonal distribution, it shows um, there are some discrepancies there, so longer data sets and using all of the available data would be highly valuable in seeing uh, more seasonal trends for the evaporative stress. And then for JEDI, which is that waveform LIDAR, you can see uh, over here we do have the much larger grids. We can't really see individual plants, which um, is very unfortunate, but uh, you can see the, the mean above ground biomass types depending on the lands. Um, and what we're seeing here is also a buffering of temperatures um, and uh, significantly less evaporative stress the more um, biomass there is composed. Um, so we are seeing um, lower correlations, but we are seeing more um, uh, clearer uh, seasonal trends as well. So uh, overall, uh, the preliminary trends show that farms with higher above ground biomass density and tree densities experience lower land surface temperatures and evaporative stresses. Uh, both data sets showed moderate correlations. Um, there were some issues with the evaporative stress data that may be due to cloud coverage or inconsistencies with the data that can be um, studied with a longer study length and other variables um, that could be analyzed as well, particularly with looking at the exact evapotranspiration that's happening as well, as well as um, EcoStress also does water usage efficiency. So that's something that I really would like to look into. Um, and then I would also like to do comparisons uh, with observed data like temperature and precipitation to actually model those seasonal variations and see how that actually compares. Um, and I would love to see some more indications on how much is actually being irrigated as trees are higher uh, intensity crops. However, um, agroforestry practices also demonstrate that trees create microclimates and reduce uh, mean temperatures for areas. So that would be a really big question and a very nice exploratory um, project. Uh, continuing, uh, JEDI data is more consistent and has a global expanse as NAEP is a USDA program and does not. Um, so fortunately, this uh, study is going to continue and we are going to be analyzing agroforestry in other regions, particularly in Tanzania. Um, however, the, uh, the trade-off is that the scale of one kilometer may not account for smaller farm practices, um, which the NAEP data does. And lastly, um, FATES modeling is a vegetation demographic model that studies how climate change and disturbances affect vegetation composition and fluxes using plant functional types. And that can go into light and nutrients, soil composition, and plant hydraulics, which I've found in other research is really important in semi-arid areas that are lacking water in San Diego County. Um, and here are some of my main references and questions. Thank you so much for listening. Great work, Judy. We have some questions, Ryan? I actually have two quick ones. Uh, would you mind going back to your uh, average ESI? Uh, where you uh, mentioned the disturbance. Do you, do you have any thoughts on what those disturbances were caused by? Yeah, um, so actually EcoStress doesn't have that much data as it's a, a global program. So um, we only have a few days over the month um, that might uh, 
that where EcoStress is actually capturing data. And March is a particularly cloudy month in San Diego. So it's possible that just those March and those very few days of data that was collected might not have been a great month. Uh, perfect, I think that might actually answer my next question. But on the next slide, um, it does seem to be um, for your, actually for both of them, um, uh, uh, best one to look for. So so the top top one uh, where it really increases for the above ground biomass mm -hmm. um, for that temperature, the season uh, not, uh, the seasonality is kind of what would make uh, kind of pops to my mind with that with the 2022. So the clouds in March actually makes a lot of sense. March in San Diego is a tr very tricky month, and especially if you're only capturing two days a month, mm -hmm. that's not going to give you very great data. So that's why I would love to look at all of the temporal data that exists for EcoStress and see if these trends exist in March of the next year, or the, uh, I mean, not the next year, the previous years. Also to start, I just wanted to acknowledge that Judy successfully defended her master's thesis earlier today, which... <laughs> So impressive to do that and to give this awesome presentation <laughs> here this afternoon. Um, but one question I kind of had for you is, have you thought about using other indices, maybe like the standardized vegetative index or any other um, indices to kind of cooperate your results and kind of... kind of co yeah, yeah, we've talked a lot about using NV NDVI. So I think that's going to be our next step. Um, and I think we're going to be using more localized models besides CESM to get a little bit more of like that temperature variability that exists within the county. Um, I wanted to know like uh, your personal motivations for doing agriculture, because it's not something that people always think about for our field. Yeah, um, uh, so I actually have a social science background. Um, and uh, I served in the Peace Corps, and I thought that agroforestry systems, I worked in coffee agroforestry systems in Panama, uh, were some of the coolest things that I've ever seen, and kind of became obsessed with them. Um, and I think that um, actually social factors drove me uh, at first to agriculture, because I thought that they were a really, like, I, I learned it from indigenous people, so I thought that it was just like really wonderful traditional knowledge. Um, and yeah, I've kind of went, so my master's thesis is on like biophysical and socioeconomic benefits of agroforestry, and now I'm looking uh, further into them uh, for modeling and global dynamics. <laughs> Any other questions for Judy? Cool. Thank you, Thank Judy. You.